Hello and welcome back to the History and Philosophy of Science in Six Easy Steps. This is your week two recap and week three introduction video. So starting with, with a recap of week two, of course we were focusing in on Thomas Kuhn and the paradigm shift concept, but we started out by watching this play called Oxygen. And the play was about who discovered O2, and as you know from uh, reading Kuhn, at this point, there are really at least two issues with the whole question. So some of you kind of struggle with this question, and that was okay. That was kind of what I was hoping for, because there are two issues. One is that discovery is almost always, as pointed out by Thomas Kuhn, a gradual process. It's a process of discovery. It's kind of a realization that occurs over time. And many times there are more than one person, there's more than one person involved in this. And the second problem that Kuhn brings out, that many of you did also, is what counts as discovery? Is it the first one, first person to see something, to just uh, note that something's there, or to isolate it in this case, as Priestley uh, isolated or produced this substance we now call oxygen? Or is it more important, or is it essential, to understand what it is? So Priestley saw this substance as deflagisticated air. He saw it as air that had been um, deprived of its phlogiston. So he saw it from within his paradigm and he did not see it as the same thing, the same way we, we see it today. Whereas Lavoisier, he understood it in much the same way that we do today. He saw it as a new substance that combined with other substances when they burn, as a component of air. And so we tend to want to credit, or many of you anyway, tended to want to credit Lavoisier. Although some of you pointed out that maybe maybe all three should be credited with the discovery. And I would take either either of those answers or any of those answers as long as you back it up with evidence and with logic. One of you included the women and said that uh, suggested that perhaps the women should be included in in the discovery process. And that was an interesting aspect of the movie, wasn't it? It was really a, a large part of, of the play was bringing out and contrasting the role of the women back then in the 1700s with the role of the modern women who were on the Nobel Committee and comparing and contrasting because in some ways uh, there were some similarities there, weren't there? So as far as your work, I want to give you a little bit of, of feedback on that. Um, all of you addressed the basic question. As I mentioned, um, some of you talked about the role of the women, which was, which was a, a really cool uh, thing to bring out, a cool insight to bring out. And then the application of, of Thomas Kuhn's ideas. All of you applied them at least to some degree, some more than others, and that was something that I was encouraging you to do or hoping you would do was to bring out Kuhn and use him and his lens to look at, at the play because um, O2 was one of uh, Thomas Kuhn's favorite examples, as you know from reading the book. But what I like about the play, and the reason that I show it, is not just because it depicts this key historical example of the paradigm shift, but it shows the personality and politics of science. A lot of people have this idea of science like it's somehow above the level of personality and politics, that it's totally objective or something like that. But as this film shows, it's really not. It is a very human endeavor. And that's something that Kuhn gets into as well, doesn't he? So moving on to assignment number five, what I was hoping you would bring out in your essays is your understanding of Kuhn's basic model. So his basic model kind of works like this in a nutshell. You start with a pre-paradigm period, and this is when a field has not really settled on a paradigm. There's a lot of different paradigms out there, a lot of different ways of looking at the world in your field. Uh, you might think about economics in that way right now. There are a lot of different kind of fundamental economic theories floating around that, that contradict each other and disagree with each other where science has, for the most part, settled on, on particular paradigms. So we start out with this pre-paradigm period of general confusion. Um, it, over time, it coalesces to form something called a paradigm, which is the same way where everybody's looking at the world in the same way. All physicists today are um, 
looking at the world through the paradigm of Einstein's theory and quantum mechanics. Okay, there, there's nobody out there who's still a Newtonian or a corpuscularian or something like that. So physics is a great example of where there's a paradigm. In fact, any scientific field is the same way right now. And then, so what we're in right now is called normal science. That's when everybody is working on the same paradigm and they're just basically doing this giant puzzle solving activity. The paradigm tells them what to expect. They're just kind of seeing if they'll get that. And then they're applying the paradigm to different, to different applications, different areas. So they're expanding it. They're also um, collecting more and more and more precise data. So they're accumulating data. They're accumulating um, more information within the paradigm. So that's the period of normal science. Now what happens is that because things get more and more precise through this normal science period and we're collecting more and more data, we keep um, using the paradigm and applying it, we start to turn up anomalies. And these anomalies are instances that, that um, don't seem to fit the paradigm. But what happens initially is these are uh, kind of swept aside. They're, they're ignored because people are committed to the paradigm. And that's okay because we need people to be, um, if people were never committed to the paradigm, there would be nothing to guide their research. It would be just confusion. But eventually this reaches crisis levels. And usually some kind of newcomer, like a Lavoisier, who was young, or John Dalton, who was a meteorologist uh, dabbling in chemistry. So you get this newcomer who's able to look with fresh eyes at these anomalies and say, wait a minute. I think there's a better way of looking at this. There's a better paradigm that would that would better explain these anomalies. And so at that point, that's where we start to get the paradigm shift. It might happen first with one person, like Lavoisier or John Dalton, and then others start to get converted to that viewpoint. Until gradually, we get everybody switched over to the new paradigm. Well, it's not really everybody because there are always holdouts like Priestley who believed in phlogiston till the end of his life or Berthollet who never accepted um, Dalton's, the, the implications of Dalton's atomic theory throughout the rest of his, his life. But um, that's just in a nutshell. So I wanted you to show that sort of outline or description that, sh that you understand his, his basic model. And then I wanted you to say whether you agree or disagree with it. Now, why would you um, not agree with it? Well, there are certain implications to that. There are certain controversial aspects of what he was saying. And I just want to bring out a few of, of them that, that some of you pointed out. One of you had an interesting idea that Kuhn could be seen as a kind of prescriptive model, that if we expect to have these periods of normal science, when we're all operating on a paradigm, and we're even a bit dogmatic about it, that we're faithful to it, that that's important. It's important that we're committed to that. And even Kuhn points, points this out, that we not throw away the theory at the first uh, trouble that it has, for example. Because, of course, there are always possible explanations for anomalies. Maybe it's a problem with the instrument and so on. Just basic uncertainty and measurement. But then we also need to be ready to shift. When the anomalies build up, when they become important, pronounced, um, when we become more certain of them, we need to be ready to shift paradigms. So I thought that was an interesting perspective. It's not something I think Kuhn did. I don't think he was prescriptive about it. I don't think he was saying this is how things should be. But I think it's an interesting application um, to kind of look at it that way. Another of you focused on three kind of issues you saw with, with Kuhn one of which was this whole concept of people in different paradigms view the world through different eyes, or they're even, as Kuhn says, living in different worlds, that they talk past each other. They can't convince each other. You can't persuade somebody who's still in the old paradigm to switch. And um, that's, it is kind of, it's, I think, one of the key points about Kuhn's, Kuhn's theory. And I'll talk more about it in a minute. And the second one, was that um, this question of absolute truth that Kuhn seems to be saying there's no absolute truth. Now, I don't think he is saying this, and he does address that question. He calls it relativism. He, he questions it in, uh, I believe it's in the postscript section. 
he says that he's been accused of being a relativist, which means there are no, there's no such thing as truth. It's all relative to the perspective of the person who's looking, right? I, but he denies that he's saying that, and I don't. So I don't think he's he's actually questioning absolute truth. Although, it is true that he's saying. I, I guess he's raising the question: Can we ever really know what's true? So. Basically, we're here in science saying that Einstein's theory is true and quantum mechanics is true. But looking at history, um, the Newtonians thought their theory was true also, didn't they? So what if we're just like them? Now, what does that mean about what we can really know? All right, That's one of the big questions that Kuhn just kind of leaves hanging out there. He starts to talk about it in his chapter on progress and in the postscript, but he uh, just kind of leaves it hanging out there for us. And then the last is this whole uh, issue of progress. Um, the third point that, that this one of your classmates brought up was this whole issue of progress. Does science progress? And I think Kuhn's answer to that is actually um, not in the way we normally think about it, progressing. It's not as if it's kind of this linear thing that's approaching some sort of, of end goal of total knowledge. It's more like evolution. Evolution doesn't progress toward a goal. It's kind of a ran random accumulation of changes and developments. And so that's probably a better way to view science is what Kuhn is saying. And then um, the third the third of your classmates who've, who's already turned in the work uh, really got heavily into uh, Kuhn's theories and Kuhn's ideas and and brought out some really interesting insights about applying this to the world. And uh, there was one other of you talked about applying the concept toward uh, that we need paradigm shifts because we don't want to get stuck in old ways of thinking, like climate change, for example, or uh, abusing the environment and the oceans. We want to be ready to shift our thinking. And um, I think this is a great insight, and it's, it's probably the most powerful thing that can come out of Kuhn and one of the things I, I hoped that you would get out of it. And it brings a certain humility, doesn't it, to, to think that we always may be wrong, that we need to have this kind of tentative hold on our theories and our ideas about the world, what we believe to be true, knowing that so did they, so did those, those old guys. They thought they had it also. And so if we keep that, I think it, it um, opens the door to a lot more of a collaborative point of view, a more collaborative way of looking at things, and at a collaborative way of, of looking at the world. I just wanted to read a little section from uh, one of your classmates here. She wrote, um, when trying to get through to someone who possesses a different paradigm, it's crucial to keep in mind that they do not see the world as you do, and the arguments that make perfect sense in your paradigm may lack any coherence in theirs. So I think that's another cool application, is that keep this in mind, because um, when you're thinking, of, when you're looking at somebody else and what they're saying, what they're doing, what their perspective is, remember this concept that they may be operating in a totally different paradigm and they may have trouble understanding you for that reason. And then um, here's another line from, from that same paper. A final manifestation of Kuhn in the modern scientist is humility of perspective. There is a substantial and enduring uncertainty of any scientific belief at the root of Kuhn's argument. For every paradigm, no matter how well established, pivoted at one time on a point of subjectivity. We cannot and can never know any aspect of current science is correct or applies to all the universe's phenomena in the same way. There's no right track or ultimate goal of science, just as there's no predestined evolutionary path for the attributes of humankind. And I think the interesting thing that comes out of this is that looking at the world in this kind of openness to uncertainty, with this kind of openness to uncertainty, is really powerful. And we're going to get into that a little bit more with uh, Karl Popper in next week's video. Now, before I, um, before we move on to Popper, I want to just mention Twitter. Um, 
You guys are getting better at Twitter at posting on there and even starting to reply to each other. Now, I'm going to put a little note in the grade books. And by the way, I shared grade books with you. If you want to go, if you want to see your grades, click on Shared with Me in your Google Drive. And you'll see a spreadsheet there that says Grades. And you can open that up and see your current grades. And I put a little note in there when you didn't reply on Twitter. I want you to make a post and then reply. Try to, try to find somebody's post that you feel like you can... Um, reply to in a conversational sort of way. Something you can add to it, a question about what they said, something like that. Think of it as a conversation, really. And uh, I hope you're enjoying our convo on Twitter. Now, introducing Popper. So our next scientist, or our next uh, philosopher of science is, is called Karl Popper. And uh, the excerpt that you'll be reading is from this book, Conjectures and Refutations, which sums up his idea. He says that science is about conjectures and refutations. We make a hypothesis and we try to disprove that hypothesis. He says that science is a theory, I should say, is scientific if it can be falsified. The more specific it is, the riskier the predictions it makes, the better it is. Things that are pseudoscience or not scientific often have explanations of the world that really can't be falsified. Um, they don't make specific enough predictions. And I'm not going to go into too much more depth on that, although I will say that the essence of, of Popper's argument is really given in the first couple of sections, the first few sections of the article that you'll be reading, the paper that you'll be reading. But I do want you to read over the last. So I want you to emphasize the first few sections. and. Um, <clears throat> but I, and then maybe you can you can uh, spend a little less time reading the rest of it. So I would say, yeah, the first two chapters of of the Popper article are the most important, but you should read the rest also. In chapter three, he it's a little tough read. He talks about another philosopher's views and how his views relate to those. In chapter four and five, though, is uh, is important. He talks about what's called the problem of induction. This is important because it is one of the central problems of the philosophy of science. And uh, this shows how, how Popper dealt with that issue, the problem of induction. Then in uh, chapter 6, he talks about what he calls dogmatic thinking, which kind of uh, corresponds to what happens in the period of normal science. And he talks, like Kuhn, about how that's kind of important. Um, but he does also, in chapter 7, contrast dogmatic thinking with what he calls a critical attitude, which is the scientific attitude. So take a look at the entire, um, at the entire piece with special emphasis on the first two. And the first two are what you're primarily going to need for your first assignment this week. Your first assignment this week is going to be to write an essay that applies Popper's views to a particular pseudoscience. So you can pick, I gave a list of pseudosciences, you could call, you could pick uh, astrology, for example, some kind of alternative medicine that you think might be a pseudoscience. And I want you to analyze it, um, answer the question, is it science or not? Is it scientific or not, according to Karl Popper? And make sure you bring in multiple sources on this, of course, using Popper, Popper's essay as one. But you can do some research on the uh, science that you've chosen. Okay, that's your first assignment. In the second, you're going to be making an infographic to compare the views of Popper and Kuhn. Now, I've provided some resources on there for you, some examples of infographics and uh, some resources to produce them online. But you can, you can just make your own with Google Draw or, or something like that. Okay, so... That should be kind of fun. I think um, I could give you a couple hints, I guess, about similarities between Popper and Kuhn. They're both really addressing, uh, in many ways, addressing the same question because they're both looking at what is science, and they both end up talking about how science progresses. So I think those are some starting points for you. Think about anomalies and how they would relate to uh, Popper's ideas and that sort of thing. So I want you to make an infographic that compares their theories or their their philosophies on as many different points as you can in as many different ways as you can. Compare and contrast. Okay. 
So I'm going to leave that up to you. Uh, get creative with that, and I think it'll be a lot of fun for you. So that's the second assignment. And there has been some controversy about, um, you know, Popper versus Kuhn, that sort of thing. So I think this should be fun for you. Okay, I hope you've been enjoying the course so far. And make sure that you remember you can always revise assignments. Um, and I will rescore them as soon as I can get to them. And also remember that you are welcome to contact me via email or Twitter anytime you have questions. Okay. I'm having fun with this, learning from you guys, reading your work. Uh, you've been doing some great work. I hope you're not discouraged when I give you um, some, some critical feedback or asking you to change something because that's what this is about. It's about improving, okay? And this is, when you make a mistake, all that means is, hey, there's somewhere where I, where I can improve. And that's what this is all about. It's a learning process. You're not supposed to be perfect the first time. That's not what I'm looking for. Okay, so have fun with that this week and uh, feel free to contact me if you need anything.